Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Ask an Angler about topwater fishing here in Oklahoma. So this one we probably shouldn't go two hours on. We only got three boxes to go through, but we're going to go over kind of what each topwater lure, uh, what it can catch, what it's meant to do when it's on the water, and the places that you might look to use it. We'll also go through some of the top bank destinations that you may go to this spring and summer to get in on some Top water action from the bank. So with all these asking anglers, they're meant to be conversational. Please, at any point, throw any questions you got over into the chat bar and we'll address them as we go along. And with that, let's do a brief overview of the top water that we're going to discuss. So when top, talking top water fishing, typically we're looking at three kind of different categories of top water bait. Those are going to be your strictly hard baits which are going to be either walk the dog type lures, propeller type lures, poppers, things of that nature um, that are going to be all hollow or uh, all plastic or metal bodied. And they're typically going to have one to two, maybe even three treble hooks attached to them. Then we have our, what are called kind of like hollow bodied or soft bodied baits. Those are primarily going to be like your hollow bodied frogs. Um, and then we kind of have our hybrid baits, which are going to be like our buzz baits that have metal or plastic components to them along with uh, either directly attached or for you to attach soft plastics to. Then we'll also briefly touch on um, some topwater flies that you might use if you're into fly fishing. So we're going to start off here with our uh, soft bodied baits, which are going to be our hollow bodied frogs. Um we're going to go through and just talk about how you might look to use these lures, when you would look to use them, where, um, and what species that they're going to target. So with our uh, hollow body frogs, so we got a box right here with a mixture of some hard body frogs and then our hollow body frogs. So our soft hollow bodied frogs typically come in like one of two styles. The first style is going to be one that's got more of the string, that soft plastic string that you'll find as it's known as a skirt. If it was on a spinner bait or a buzz bait or a jig, same material and it hangs off. Then we have the hollow body. So nice soft plastic, and these are meant to be fished weedless. So you're able to throw these into really, really dense cover through big grass mats, maybe if you're in a really heavily wooded area, or if you have lily pads, things where you just kind of want to work this across the top in tight to get to areas that you may not be able to punch with um, like Texas rig baits or drop shot baits or any type of top water that's going to have those trebles that's going to be susceptible to getting hung up on the cover that you're to tossing into. Now, these are great. Any style of frog you're going to have, you know, a dark colored body that you're going to want to have and then a lighter colored body. So this is going to be more of a mimicker of our uh, bullfrogs that we have, especially the juveniles. They're going to have that nice dark back and then they're going to have that lighter underbelly, whether it be yellow, tan, orange, some form of that. But it's going to be a lighter shade. And then our darker hollow bodied frogs. These are going to be great when you're like skipping docks. You're putting this up underneath cover overhanging branches. And as they sit on the top, when we have these nice dark bodies, while they are still imitating a frog, we get a lot of action with our largemouth bass late April all the way through May into June. And then again, a little bit in the fall of skipping these up underneath heavy cover, whether that be docks, overhangs, trees, what have you that are going to create some shade. And what this is going to really do a good job of mimicking when it's sitting on the water are sunfish species. So sunfish, like the name, your bluegill, your red ear, your green sunfish, but primarily your long ear, bluegill, and uh, your green, and then any hybrids of, they're going to sit high up in the water column, especially as we get into the summer months during the day. So they're going to be right up near the surface. And what that looks like to a largemouth bass sitting up under a dock is they see that big dark profile and they may be thinking sunfish and that's what they predate on pretty heavily for most of the year, but especially as we get into the warm water months. So having a couple different options of your hollow body to use. Now, these are going to perform really well in your ponds and on your reservoirs. Uh, 
you may get some action out of them if you're in like a riverine system, a creek or a or a major river, like a blue river or a barren fork, you know, where you might just get a small mouth, spotted bass, large mouth wants to come up and look. But these are really going to excel in your heavily vegetated cover, typically on ponds, smaller impoundments that get a lot of vegetative growth because one, they're not very deep. So they typically get sunlight penetration all the way down to the lake bed, which is then going to enhance vegetative growth, which is typically going to come in the form of grass, weeds, hydrilla, um, lily pads, uh, yellow floating heart, anywhere where there's just that real thick, heavy top of the water or just subsurface cover that you really can't get a whole lot else through. That's where these are going to come in very prevalently throughout the course of the entire day. So with these hollow bodies, we're typically just targeting largemouth bass. That's going to be the majority of the species that are going to come and take strikes at these hollow bodied frogs. So once we go through the spawning cycle, which we're pretty much in right now across the state for largemouth bass, they're, they're in a lot of places, they're at peak, even moving towards the post end of their spawning run, central Oklahoma, northern Oklahoma, we're getting right there into the peak right now. And as those fish spawn, some will retreat back to offshore cover. So just depending on the fish in the lake, you'll get plenty of bass that are going to retreat offshore. They're going to go back into that 10 to 20 foot water column, find some structure, find old road beds, things to get down in that cooler water as that water heats up. But a lot of those bass are going to stay near shore for most of the summer, um, especially in late April, May, June, when water temperatures are still only in the high 50s ranging all the way to the low to mid 70s. Once we start getting temperatures in the water pushing upper 70s, low to mid 80s, then we're really focusing on top water, especially in your smaller bodies of water in the evening and morning hours. Those big bass will push back up as the sun starts to go down. They'll spend the overnight hours in the shallows hunting. And then as we start to push into the 9, 10 o'clock hour in the morning, they're going to retreat back out when those water temperatures are too hot. But you're going to get a really good six-week window from about right now into the early to middle half of June, especially as we get spring rains flooding, get a lot of submerged um, you know, brush, structure things up on the bank grass that those bass are going to favor when those water levels are stable and then as we start to draw back down after flooding and you get more normal stabilized water then they're going to look to be pushing back up into those normal habitats that are typically subsurface not the areas that are flooded the only knock that you're going to find on hollow bodied frogs like this so one that is like this so these are kind of your other hollow bodied frogs that instead of having that skirt off the back they're going to have just a singular body attachment with some type of rubber leg or bumpers or kickers that are off the back. Now, most of them, like these newer ones, you're going to find on these types of hollow bodied where that eye hole is not connected to the hook point itself. So what you find on these hollow bodied frogs is that that eye hole is not connected. It's jointed with this. So what ends up happening is you have to be, be very mindful when you're topwater fishing of any kind, but especially with these hollow bodies where the fish can actually squeeze in this and then you penetrate with the hook point. But what can happen is if they hit it so violently or hit it at a weird angle on some of these with the joints, they'll actually rotate around and you end up not getting a good hook set or it'll pop the entire piece of plastic up like this and you don't get a hook set. That is just wear and tear. It's going to happen. Um, the longer you can allow for fish when they strike top water, and it's very difficult for even the most, you know, uh, accomplished of anglers, when you get that surface strike, it's visual, it's exciting. You want to be able to set that hook, but you really got to tell yourself when you're top water fishing, especially when you're using like hollow body frogs, allow that fish to grab that bait and completely go underwater with it. If you go and try to set that hook the second that you get the blow up, especially with these, there's a lot of things that can happen with that hook where they're pressing in on that body and you may just pull clean and clear or you just get a bad hook set. And that is really the only knock that you're going to get with these hollow body frogs. Otherwise, amazing 
largemouth bass lures from late April through June, and then a little bit again in the fall when they push up shallow. But at that time, you're typically starting to lose a lot of your vegetative cover, and you're usually more suited to be using something with a wheel on the back, a propeller bait, or some type of buzz bait to get their attention when they're chasing bait. But in the late spring, early summer, they really get focused in on sunfish and terrestrials. So that's going to be your frogs, ducklings, uh, lizards, snakes, grasshoppers, sunfish that are up on the top. But that's what they're going to look to key in on. So these, with any of these topwater lures, you have several options of tying on. Personally, I am always directly tied on with my main line. So I don't use a swivel. I don't put a loop knot in. I just tie a straight improved clinch knot if I'm using monofilament and I'm going to use braided line um, with a Palomar knot if that's what I'm using. You try to stay away from fluorocarbon uh, line, especially unless it's maybe a leader line attached to braid if you're in super clear water and you want to just give yourself a little bit extra. But in those situations, you're better off using a monofilament that's got a little bit of stretch to it. Stretching your line comes in handy when you're fishing top water. So monofilament, just a straight main line, is always going to give you that extra split second of stretch to be able to set the hook. Braided line is going to have zero stretch, but it floats. Fluorocarbon sinks. So if you're using a big long cast on still water, like a pond or a lake, that line, especially if you're casting 30, 40, 50, 60 feet away from you, what's going to end up happening is baits like these are not meant to be moved all that quickly through the water. You know, you're kind of pop, pop, maybe hopping it from a lily pad into open water in between a lily pad back onto a lily pad or working it, you know, through some uh, sticks or stumps or things like that. But typically baits like these, you're not moving very quickly. Um, so it's going to allow tons of time for that fluorocarbon to sink underwater. And that's going to adversely affect how this works because it's going to try to dive that nose down. And you really want that nose pointed a little bit upwards and floating. So as you're skirting it across the water, it stays on the top because these are hollow bodied. So if they get subsurface, they will fill up with water and they'll start to sink on you. So Fluorocarbon is never ideal when you're fishing top water. The only place you can really get away with it is when you're fishing rivers and streams that have some current. You're typically making casts that are much shorter. You're not fishing, you know, you're not casting as far away. You might be standing in the stream bed or on a boat. And you're probably only casting, you know, 15, 20 feet. So you're only looking to move that bait five or six feet to get your strike. In those cases, you probably have your rig already rigged up to fish that clear water with fluorocarbon. So if you're going from a subsurface bait to a topwater bait, you're going to get away with it with fluorocarbon because the water is moving. It's going to keep that fluorocarbon up top. It's not going to allow it time to uh, sink. But that's something to always be mindful of when you're topwater fishing. Your two main lines are going to be braided line. And then monofilament. You really want to avoid fluorocarbon, especially when you're in still water. Um, look over. We got a couple questions. Uh, why do pros lay down when they have a fish hook? To me, that situation should cause slack in the line and lose faith in the fish. So in when you're talking about, you're talking about like Bassmaster Classic, MLF, professional bass anglers who are landing fish, laying down on the deck of their boat. That's because they're... Uh, I, I believe it's in the rules. They're not allowed to use a net. If not, nobody uses nets and it's a gentleman agreement, but I, I think that they don't, they're not allowed to use nets. And so when you have a big fish hooked on and you can't just flip it into the boat, those guys are going to get down right on the water, lay down flat. But yeah, it will create some slack and you do see a lot of fish that are lost at the boat, but that's why they lay down picking up a fish. They don't have, they can't scoop it up with the net. So those bigger fish, you're not going to try to fork in because you might snap your line or something might happen. Um, liability and insurance to fish the open tournament. I'm not the, uh, not the person to answer that question. Um, but so anyways, with these, uh, with these hollow body, that's what you're looking to use your ponds, your small, uh, impoundments, skipping docks with the darker color. You're going to get a lot of action as far as sunfish bites go. And then using more of your traditional bullfrog colors, that yellow, tan, orange underbelly with a darker green or black or brown top. And then just working these kind of parallel with the bank. So if you're fishing from the bank and you've got a nice big cove or point that comes in and you got a bunch of vegetated cover, just making casts start out right on the shoreline, bringing it, and then just move your lure out 
a foot at a time until you get to the edge of that weed line and work an entire section of shore like that. If you're on a boat, you're going to kind of fan cast around, work a lot of different types of cover. But typically your hollow body frogs are going to get the most action consistently on your smaller bodies of water, your ponds, small impoundments. Um, but these are going to be your two go-to, something with a lighter color, darker back, and then just an all black with maybe even blue mixed in something that's more of like a sunfish type pattern, even though it's a frog. And that's where you're going to be looking to use those. But very important with those hollow bodies that you give that fish time to engulf that bait, completely go down, especially if you don't see them throw it. Because a lot of times they come up, you've got these in real tight spaces like this. You're in between a couple of lily pads. That bass comes up and get, takes a poor angle at it. And they just miss it. I mean, they'll hit it, knock it up in the air, or they kind of side swipe it. A lot of times you'll just get exploratory bites, especially if you're in crystal clear water and those fish can really see it. They might come up not fully committed. So it's very important that in any situation where they're taking a strike at it, that you just give that fish time to get back below the surface before you go ahead and rear that hook point back. And if you are using braided line, you do want to have that good classic, you know, bass rip hook set um typically with the frogs when you're fishing them you want to keep your rod tip either parallel with the water or all the way up to 12 o'clock somewhere in that nine or three to 12 o'clock keeping that rod tip up you don't want to get it too low down on the water where you're kind of working it like a jerk bait where you're pushing that rod tip down with your top water baits because we're moving water and we want to keep it on the top at worst you want to be parallel with the water but in a lot of cases you want to be even upward, uh, especially if you're fishing from the bank where you're already parallel with that water. You're basically standing at water level. When you're in a boat, you're up off the water a foot to a few feet, depending on your boat and the platform of your bow or your stern and how you're fishing. So in those cases, holding the rod tip up is, you know, there's too much downline. So you're pulling the bait up out of the water. In those cases, you know, you're going to be closer to parallel with the water or maybe even just slightly below parallel. And that's only if you're fishing off a platform, like a big pier dock or a boat. But if you're just fishing from the shoreline on the bank straight, you know, if you're casting shorelines, just working that hollow body frog, keeping that rod tip parallel with the water and just moving it along and working each little pocket of water, step it up on a, uh, you know, a pad or a stump or something like that. Let it sit there. A lot of times you'll start to see the lily pads move or grass move. You'll see a bass positioning itself under the water by watching the movement of those weeds to get itself in a good position. And in that way, you know, when you pop it out into that next piece of open water, you're anticipating the strike, which gives you a little bit more thought process of, okay, here that fish comes, let them grab it, let them take it back under then go ahead and rear that hook set back. And then if you're just using monofilament, which is a great main line, um, readily available, cheap, little bit of stretch to it, it floats. In those cases, you can really give that fish some time because you're going to get that stretch when it grabs it. With that braided line, it's basically grab underwater, set that hook and set it hard because you have no stretch. So all your hook set is going to be on that first attempt. And in a lot of cases, you'll see guys rear that hook back, take a couple reels down on the fish, and then try to, you know, kind of a mini hook set again, just to make sure that hook point is buried. But braided line is a lot more favorable when you are working areas of dense cover, thick grass, thick hydrilla, thick lily pads. That braid, once the fish is hooked and it's underwater, it's really going to cut through all of that uh, thick vegetation a lot better than monofilament will. So, if you're looking to rig up a top water um, setup, the ideal setup is a bait caster or a spin caster. Something where because you're picking up, you get a lot of slack in the line. If you're using spinning equipment to throw your top water, you really got to be aware of you know your line class, your rod class, making sure you're not getting enough slack in that line. Because if you are using poppers or using um, hollow bodied frogs, things that are naturally stopping and going, there's going to be slack in your line. And what happens when you get slack in the line on those open face spinning reels is with that slack, the memory that you have in the line will create a twist. You end up reeling that twist in your spool without noticing it. Then the next time you go to cast, 
get the big bird's nest that comes out. That doesn't happen on our casting reels and our spin casting equipment. So an ideal setup for topwater fishing is dense, heavy vegetation, especially with hollow bodied things or weedless topwater braided line, 30 pound up to 65 pound, um, medium heavy or heavy action casting rod or spin casting rod, and then a casting reel and a spin casting reel. Uh, or you're going to be looking at using like maybe a 14 to 17 pound monofilament, just depending on your weight and reel class and then the size of these lures. So a hollow body frog is pretty, you know, weighted. It's going to be a quarter ounce or a half ounce. You're going to be able to throw that on most medium to heavy action rods. You won't have a problem with it. Spinning equipment is going to zing it out there anyways. But if you are using spinning equipment, probably want to look to be using more open water. Um, baits that you're straight casting and retrieving something with a propeller on it um, or a buzz bait where you're just casting out and straight retrieving um, that all three types of your main um, rod and reel combos that you would have are going to perform well there. But if you start using the stop and go lures, the walk, the dogs, the poppers, um, the hollow bodied frogs, the rattle frogs, things where you really have a lot of pauses um, a spinning reel and spinning setup is more than likely going to work against you a lot of the time because you're just going to get twists in the line. So something to think about once you get in um, to setting up your uh, topwater uh, rig, because really you only need one. You know, if you have just a topwater rod that you always have spooled and ready to go, that's great. You know, you're only using that for that. But if you're the type of person who gets lots of multi-purpose out of the same rod and reel, um, you know, things like fluorocarbon are to be avoided if you're using a spinning reel, uh, or if you are using a spinning reel that you might look to use those moving baits and not so much your stop and go baits, but you definitely, if you're, if you're adept at using your spinning equipment, you can certainly do the pauses and pops. You just have to know your equipment better to make sure you're not getting those twists in the line. Um, so from our hollow bodies, Let's move over to our hard bodied baits, which is going to be the majority of the topwater baits that you're going to find on the market today um, for traditional equipment, casting or spinning equipment. So we'll start with our rattle frog. So this bait is something that can either slowly be worked across the water. It can be paused and popped. As you'll notice up here at our eye hole, we don't really have anything to indicate a popping motion. So there's no concave. It's not meant to, you know, go in and throw water out in front of it. But what you can do with a bait like this is you can straight retrieve it. And because it kind of sits on this Y axis where it goes off on both sides, it's going to create a nice kind of loose to tight wobble, depending on how fast you're retrieving it. You're going to get a nice wake behind it. But with most of these hard baits, top waters that you're using, they are going to have either one to three treble hooks underneath them, which means they should not be cast in and around dense vegetation or thick overhead cover where they're susceptible to catching a treble hook on a stick up or a log or, you know, grass or lily pads that are either just at the surface or within a couple inches of the surface you're going to get hung up a lot or casting them near moss or algae type areas. So these are really work meant to be working the edges around docks around that thick vegetation working the outside lines with something like this now this has on the inside you can hear all those rattle balls in there so you're getting a um, auditory signature up on the top as well as creating a bit of a weight and you got those really good colors with it that dark back that light underbelly really good profile size um you know, you're looking at basically fingertip to just below the knuckle. So really good bait profile. You're going to catch a lot of <clears throat> small to medium sized bass on these ponds, uh, reservoirs, even in creeks and rivers. But you got a nice, good frog size profile. This is what the majority of the frogs on most ponds are going to be somewhere in this size class. So you're also going to get those big blow ups from those four plus pound large mouth that are willing to come up and take a strike. But again, lures like this really were designed to catch black bass and in particular large mouth bass. So you're going to get the most value out of a bait like this fished in ponds, 
small impoundments. That's where these are really going to perform well. And you're going to be looking to cast these into open water immediately adjacent to heavy cover. So if you can fish the back of a cove and there's not a lot of cover, maybe it's rocky bottom. Perfect. You just work these back and you kind of decide how you like to fish them. You can pop and pause them. So just like a popper, you can pull it forward. It's going to splash a little bit, but because it doesn't have a concave, it's not going to throw a bunch of water. But a lot of those baits don't have rattles inside. So the auditory is the splash. So with these, not only are you creating more of a subtle splash, which is more indicative of a terrestrial bait that's on the water, they're going to be making a little bit of action, but it's not going to be bait fish flying all over the place, boiling water. So these are really more for that subtle presentation in your smaller bodies of water um, where your largemouth bass are looking to ambush an unsuspecting frog. But you can straight cast them out and slowly retrieve them in. And you're just going to create a nice little wake, good color and uh, size profile, and you'll get those strikes. Now with these types of baits that have the treble hook, while it is still important to allow that fish to grab the bait and take it under, when you have the treble hooks, it is in your favor. More than likely, the strike itself is going to equate to a point of one of those trebles making contact and then making penetration, uh, regardless of your hook set. Now, if they get all of it, now you've got six hook points in the fish's mouth and a good hook set you're probably going to have a really good hook set. Um, but with your treble hooks, you get those open water strikes. Fish are not as aggressive when they're in open water, um, except for our temperate species that are schooling. So when you're looking to pick off sunfish, any of the black bass species that are going to come up in kind of that quieter, calmer water, if it is out in the open, if there is no cover or structure near it, it is going to be a quick strike. Those fish do not like to expose themselves in open water. They're ambush predators. They like thick, heavy vegetative cover to come make an aggressive strike. So if you do find bass that are more out in that open water or on the edges, it's going to be a quicker strike. They're less likely to come full bore to come get it. It's going to be more of a quick kind of sweeping motion right across the surface and back down, which is good for you as the angler because it typically leads to better hookups, better strikes. When they're coming out of that vegetative cover or thick cover, they're going to take a really aggressive hit at it. But because of that, if they don't grab it flush, they can throw the bait in either direction and you end up with either a missed hook set, completely swing and miss from the fish, or you just don't get a good hookup once you've already got the fish. But rattle frogs typically come in, you know, a few different color patterns, but sticking with your natural frogs, those lighter underbellies, those darker overheads, good size profile, you know, two inch, two and a half inch bait profile. Those are always going to get more strikes. Um, you start getting into the big four to eight inch bait profiles for any type of lure, subsurface or top water. You're essentially eliminating your cast to a big fish because that's the only thing that can come get it. If you stick in that two to three inch bait profile, you're going to catch a lot of fish that are in the eight to 12 inch range, but you're still leaving it wide open to catch, you know, as big of a fish is willing to come up and hit. So those are typically the size profiles that you're looking for with both black bass, as well as our temperate bass species, our stripers, our hybrid striped bass, um, and our white bass. Now, if you're looking to target like sunfish, your bluegill, your red ear, green sunfish, whatever, you know, what have you, depending on what part of the state you're in, whether you're fishing a pond, a lake, or a creek, or river, um, you're going to want to look for smaller profile hard baits, things like hula poppers, um, things like rebel crickets or hoppers that come in more of like an inch to an inch in seven eighths profile. A lot of the, these are going to come with just a single treble hook behind them or a single point hook. And like poppers, they have a concave nose with the eye hole right here. So these are meant to displace water out in front of them, looking like either a small bait fish coming up to hit something on the surface and moving water could be a terrestrial, like a frog or a grasshopper, something that's making a little bit more commotion up top, but you get a really good size profile and like that inch and a half inch and seven eighths. And they make them as small as like an inch, inch and a quarter. So these are great pond baits. Hula poppers are going to be one of your prime time, small body of water, your creeks, your 
farm ponds, your city ponds, your small city lakes and impoundments, you're going to get a lot of value out of something like a hula popper because you're pretty much going to be able to catch anything that's willing to take a surface bait. And that could, you know, on somebody's water, that might be a channel catfish that's willing to come up, especially if you're right over the top of it and it's sitting there, you can get catfish that'll come up and take a whack at a hula popper, but you're going to be right in that perfect size range to catch really nice eater sized uh, sunfish. And you're going to catch a wide variety of your large mouth and spotted bass that you're, you know, more than likely to find in your ponds and small impoundments. You get on the eastern half of the state, our clear water streams and creeks, you might pull up some smallmouth bass as well with something like a hula popper. But again, with these nose hole, your eye guide right here, you know, I'm tied directly on. Now you can tie a loop knot, you can put a swivel, a snap swivel on. It's just really whatever the preference is for you. I always prefer to have direct contact with my bait, with the knot from either my leader line or my main line. Um, I don't like using swivels. I don't like using loop knots um, when it comes to top water because I want to have constant contact with that bait. So when I do get a strike, I'm feeling every inch of it. And when I go to make that hook point, there's no opportunity for that bait to swing on me when I go to get a nice good hook set. But hula poppers are definitely up there as a top, top water lure, especially for people who are just getting in to fishing. And with these, because of the popper nature of them and because they are so small and light, you actually can throw these on like some light action, medium light action spinning equipment. No more than eight pound test, but probably like four to six pound monofilament. It's going to be perfect for baits like these. And what you can do with the spinning setup, instead of using the rod tip to pop it and then pick up your slack, you can kind of point your rod tip straight at your bait. So you put that rod tip and point it straight at your lure and give a hard reel crank. And that reel crank is going to accomplish the same thing that moving your rod tip would, but you're creating no slack in your line. So all you have to do, and, and you're ready. So instead of pointing it like straight at it, if it was right in front of us, just angle it just so slightly off to the side. It doesn't need to be back here at three o'clock, but more at like one o'clock or 11 o'clock if that bait's out in front of you. That way, when you get the strike, you're in perfect position to pull that rod tip straight back and get a good hook set. And just by cranking the reel handle, instead of popping it with the rod tip, um, you're going to avoid getting that slack in your line. And these are easier to throw on something like a light action, medium light action, spin casting or spinning equipment than you would get from your traditional bass casting equipment. That's going to be heavier line, heavier action rods. These things are super light. They're only going to weigh up to maybe an eighth of an ounce, but most of them are going to be somewhere in that 132nd to 116th ounce, which is more suited to be thrown on light action spinning tackle. And that's kind of how you can get away with not getting those dreaded line twists. Um, so speaking of our pond killers and our small bodies of water killers, really hard to beat jitterbug. So this is an arbogast. This is a very classic old school lure. It's been around for a really long time and it's what's considered a wake bait. So you have this nice big front on it with a downward facing eye hole. So these are meant to be straight retrieved in. You're not popping them. You're doing nothing with the rod tip. You're casting them straight out. They are going to have those treble hooks. So you're looking to throw them over either cover vegetation that is, you know, within a foot of the surface, but not anything higher. You don't want to be getting caught up on loose weeds or anything that are going to catch on these trebles, but you're going to cast these out. They come in a couple different colors or a few different colors, but you're always going to be best suited with like a black. They make one that is going to look more like this frog color, the green top with that light underbelly, and you're going to get action out of those. But if you were looking for one or the other, your black, especially on your ponds, small impoundments, this is going to be tough to beat as your overall best topwater lure that you can use. It's super low profile. It's very quiet. It creates just a little bit of a gurgle and a slight wake behind it which in those smaller bodies of water where there is not boat traffic, not a lot of swimming traffic, probably not a lot of fishing pressure, those fish are really looking for subtle bait presentations. They are not looking to go chase a huge buzz bait across the top. It's not to say you won't get a strike doing that, but more often than not, you're going to get consistently bit on the top in ponds 
and in small city lakes on something like this. And with these, with that nice overhead shape, kind of heart shape with that uh, eye hole facing down, you're just pointing again, you want to be pointed straight at it. So parallel with the water off to one side, you know, 10 o'clock to two o'clock, but not at noon, just so you're off to one side. So when you get that strike, you're in the perfect position to go ahead and just set that hook point either straight up or straight to the side in a sweeping motion. But you're just going to slowly retrieve these. You can pause them occasionally, wobble them along, and it's just going to be working like this, just making that little jitter action back and forth. Doing that, this is going to displace just a little bit of a wake. So it could look like a small bait fish, could look like a frog, a lizard, snake, anything that's just kind of moving right just subsurface or on top of the surface. It's going to be super quiet. It's going to create a little bit of a gurgle. So if it's super calm out and there's no noise around you, you will hear that gurgle. If there's a little bit of wind or uh, ambient noise where you can't hear it, you're still going to see that wake. And a lot of times the strikes with these are going to be pretty subtle. They're going to come up right behind it, kind of create that vacuum and your bait's just going to disappear. A lot of times they won't take that huge, big out of the water strike with these. It's going to be more get right in behind it. They're going to follow that wake. And when they're ready to go, they're just going to get right up behind it and suck it down. Got those two big treble hooks. You're going to get a good hookup. Um, but this one right here for sure is always a big winner when it comes to our smaller bodies of water in that darker color. That's really going to be a bang up um, largemouth lure, especially for some bigger fish when we get into the post spawn here in May into early June. And, you know, with most topwater fishing, you're always going to see the most success early morning hours, later evening hours, the low light periods, and then after dark. So if you're using a headlight or you're just listening, casting to an area you're really familiar with, it might be your own pond, body of water, you fish a lot, you know every cast, you can literally fish blind listening or with feel, or you can use a headlight and spotlight and put it right on that lure. But that's when you're going to see the most success. But when we're in these cooler months right now, April all the way into May, we're typically seeing water temps that are always going to be somewhere below 75 degrees, unless you're just way in the Southern part of the state. So that's going to keep largemouth, especially bigger fish, your four plus pound largemouth. They're going to stay fairly active in shallow water for a good stretch of time um, after they're done with their spawning cycle. So right now fishing is probably up and down for largemouth, just depending on where you're at. If you're still in the pre-spawn, you're probably seeing phenomenal fishing. If your fish are in the peak of the spawn, it's probably slowed down unless you're sight fishing and targeting. Um, but the second they finish that spawn, they go right back into that post-spawn gorge and water temperatures are just ideal for largemouth bass to be super active for the majority of the day. So you will get topwater action in May and early June throughout the course of the day. But as you get farther into the, the summer, once you start seeing temperatures really into the mid 70s, high 70s, low 80s for water temps, you're going to be most apt at getting bites on top water, morning hours, evening hours, overnight hours. Um, so let's stick with our kind of popper style baits. Um, now with our popper baits, we're kind of moving into uh, a wider range of the species that you might catch and it's just going to come down to where you're fishing at. So if you're fishing a big or a medium size impoundment around the state that has temperate bass in it, which in most bodies of water of the state, that's going to be white bass. But a lot of our bodies of water around the state are going to have hybrid striped bass and several are going to have striped bass. These are open water schoolers. So if you are fishing from a boat, you can get into top water action at any time during the day basically by following the birds around. If you see birds diving on the water and you're out on a boat and you want a topwater fish or you're just looking to locate temperate bass, follow the birds. The birds are going to lead you right to where the bait is at and where there is bait in open water is where our temperate bass species are going to be. They rely almost exclusively on shad and minnows in open water as their forage base. So unlike largemouth, smallmouth, uh, spotted bass, sunfish species, that are going to have a very kind of omnivore uh, type diet. They're going to be eating bugs, crayfish, terrestrials, bait fish, sunfish. They're going to eat a whole range of different types of bait because they're ambush predators. Our temperate bass are schooling fish. So they are working together 
for safety and for hunting to push bait balls of open water shad or minnows, shiners, darters, whatever it may be in the body of water you're fishing. But they're going to be looking to push that bait around and they really like to push them up to the surface because they're an open water feeder instead of like bass that may get together and push bait into the back of a cove and kind of hunt them that way, which white bass will do, especially in the early morning and late evening hours. But typically you're more offshore or near shore, but in that deeper open water, kind of off of transition points, points, ledges, channel drops. Um, so they're using their school to really kind of wind that bait up. And instead of letting it get out in front of them and spread out, and move around, they're trying to get their school underneath that bait and they will slowly push that bait up towards the surface and when they get them up near the top that's when those birds are going to start diving and you know that they're subsurface feeding and a lot of times when you drive your boat up and get on top of where you see those birds you're also going to see the boils that are coming of those fish hitting on the top and that's when things like just your traditional concave straight popper could have a tail off of the back could not have a tail off of the back but these are all good size profiles. You're looking for stuff in shad patterns. So that's going to be your yellows and blues, silvers and whites. Um, typically, your temperate bass are not very picky as far as your base of blue, chartreuse, orange, silver. Something in those patterns is going to draw attention. It's really more about the, the size profile. So the difference between like our largemouth bass and our temperate bass species, really even our spotted and our smallmouth in comparison to their size, a really, really big striper. So a 20 plus pound striper is still only going to have a mouth on it like this when it's fully open. That's not very big. That's going to be the same size as a, you know, one and a half to two and a half pound largemouth bass. So what they can actually get up and on, even your bigger temperate bass species your big white bass are only going to have mouths that are like that. So they're really, for the most part, munching on one inch, two inch, maybe three inch bait profiles. So you get out there throwing, you know, big lures like this. You're really only targeting a really big striper, maybe a big hybrid, but you're almost, you're pretty much eliminating getting true strikes from white bass. You will get white bass that'll come up and hit big lure profiles like this you know, your five, six inch profiles, but you're catching them because they're face plating the treble hooks. So they come up, take a swipe, have no chance of getting a clean from behind hit on it, but you still end up with all these treble hooks and they get face plated. But if you're on a Texoma below a tailwater, like a car or a Keystone, a Eufaula where you are, or a Illinois river during the summer, lower Illinois, you're going to get those 15, 20, 30 pound stripers in the mix. That's really the only time that you're going to look to use that five, six, seven, eight inch top water plug, whether it be a popper, a walk the dog, a propeller style bait. And that's when you can get a true big strike, clean hit up behind. And you might catch a few fish that are going to come up and take a strike, but you're really looking at your bait profiles in that two to three inch range. This is what you're going to catch more fish this way. And you're certainly going to still have the ability to catch those bigger fish, but you're going to catch all of those half pound up to four pound fish with poppers. And again, with your poppers, you're more than likely, you know, pop and pause, pop and pause, pop and pause, pop, pop, pause. Uh, so your spinning equipment, again, is going to work against you. But just like with the hula poppers, you cast these out straight in front of you, put that rod tip parallel with the water at one o'clock or, or uh, 11 o'clock, and then quick reel handle, and it'll slash it through the water. Pause. Slash it through the water. If you're using bait casting or spin casting equipment, you can pop pop it with the reel tip and pick that slack up without the fear of it twisting, especially if you're going to use braided line. Typically, in most of the water of Oklahoma, outside of a few select areas in the eastern and southeastern part of the state that really do have that crystal clear water where, and they typically get a lot of fishing pressure down there. That's really the only area we're going to like a 10 to 17 pound mono is going to work in your favor as far as concealing your line. Anywhere else, I almost always recommend using braid um, as your main lure or your main line. 
tied directly onto your top water. You're not likely to get snagged. So you don't have to worry about that braid and snapping your braid and getting, you know, hung up. You're going to have great fish fighting ability, whether you're getting drugged down into heavy vegetation or you just got a really big fish in open water. You get that extra break strength with the small diameter line, which makes it easy for casting. So I typically will run with my top water uh, lines. I'll use a medium heavy casting rod and reel, and I'll use 30 pound braid. You can go up to 50 or 65. I don't usually find it necessary. I got plenty with 30, even if I get dug down into uh, some he heavy vegetation, but it's going to be a smaller diameter. It's going to cast a little bit better. You're going to get a little extra length with your cast and pretty much I-35 over to Stroud. I mean, he really over into Tulsa. You could draw a straight line from Kansas to Texas. Everything west of that braided line, you're in you're in water that is at least somewhat uh, visibility stained. You get east of that, you get east of kind of the the Indian Turnpike from Tulsa down to Antlers. You get east of that, you might find some water that you might look to use a monofilament instead of braided line just for the line visibility. But more often than not, you're getting, especially open water fish, temperate bass, there's so much commotion going on. They have no idea that that line's there. If you're trying to bring a small mouth, large mouth up in that clear water on a lake like a Broken Bow or a Cedar Lake, where you got really crystal clear water, heavy fishing pressure, those fish have seen a lot of different lures and baits. That's where you might elect that, you know, maybe even using lighter line, eight pound test, 10 pound test monofilament to conceal that line action with that bait. But that's really the only time that it would come into play. Otherwise, 30 pound braided line, casting equipment or spinning equipment, throw in the top water, that line's going to float, got good action, good connection to your lure. You're probably going to get pretty good hook setups. And if you happen to plug a lunker, you got plenty of fighting ability with that line. You don't have to worry about line snappage in open water or in the vegetative cover. The only place where you might pay attention to your braided line is if you're fishing like a dam or riprap. That braid, if they drag you down into a boulder field or rocks, that's the one place where your braid is going to, you know, have the vulnerability towards abrasion and getting frayed. But aside that, that's just so few and far between that the majority of the time, 30 pound braided line casting equipment, medium up to a heavy action rod, just depending on what you're targeting. And that's going to be perfect for you, but perfect poppers, you know, great all around bait. You will catch large mouth spotted small mouth. You'll even get sunfish to come take swipes at these in the shallows bait profiles, a little big for your sunfish, but you're going to catch, bass on these, but these really come in handy when you're in that open water uh, off of points fishing from the bank, or if you're out on a boat chasing, surfacing temperate bass around, poppers are going to be one of your best friends in those situations. Um, another great open water bait, which is great in rivers, as well as for all of our species um, of top water hitters, are going to be our kind of walk the dog style lures, which depending on who you talk to and what they're referring to. A walk the dog lure is essentially a bait that doesn't really have anything to it. It's long and slender. It doesn't have a concave nose on it. Um, the purpose of it is to kind of walk it back and forth. So they're going to be baits that look like this. They're going to be small, slender, kind of tube shaped. I hold directly off the bait facing downward to keep that nose kind of up. So when you're pulling it down, it's moving through the water like this. And all we're trying to do, if you cast it out and it's looking back at you, these are the types of baits. You can get the cadence down right with the spinning reel. It's going to take you a little bit if you've never done it before. But in order to avoid, because you will get bad line twists with these types of lures because they sit up high. And if you're popping the rod and doing that to make it work, it means you're going in motion. So in order to walk it, it's tap, reel, tap, reel, tap, reel, tap, reel. And you're just doing it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth you're going to have plenty of time to get those twists. So you can walk it with just the reel. You just have to figure out the cadence. So once you get it moving, you have to, it's kind of like a pendulum. Swings this way, it swings this way. So you just have to be in rhythm of making that bait walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then you can pause it. A lot of times strikes will come in the pause, especially from your black bass. But like temperate bass, you might want to work it real fast. You know, it's just back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. That's a lot easier with the casting reel or spin casting equipment where that is you're 
pop in the water kind of in a downward trajectory or level, but more downward because you have that eye hole facing downward. So if you're pulling it sideways, it's going to try to pull it up and it'll lose that front end action where it's catching right here. So you really want to be popping it either parallel with the water or a little bit downward, especially if you're up above it, like on a boat or a casting platform, fishing jetty where you're really high above the shoreline, then it's a downward. And when you're using that uh, casting equipment or spin casting equipment where you're not really getting the twist, especially if you're using braided line, then you just got to figure out the cadence. It's just pop reel, pop reel in each direction. Just, you know, you can pop it straight down once you get really good at the cadence, moving it back, or you can help yourself by kind of angling it one way, angling it the other way, back and forth, back and forth. But these are great when you're fishing for temperate bass, especially in like tail waters or in the open water, you can tie on a dropper hook. So taking like a small, either like baby shad on a 132nd ounce jig head, a 132nd ounce hair jig or marabou jig, walk this across the top, have this down below. Sometimes you can end up with three white bass. You get one that hits the trailer, you'll get two that'll take a swipe and you got one on each treble hook. So this is really popular like in tailwaters, especially like Keystone and Caw, using that kind of dropper bait. If you have surfacing fish, but maybe it's not a true boil, but there are fish higher up in the water column, because most of the time your white bass, they're either on the top or they're on the bottom. They don't spend a lot of time mid water column. So if you're getting those sporadic surface rises, but it's not like the entire school, that's where something like this opens up the range of fish that are feeding high in the water column, but haven't pushed the bait high enough to truly be a top water boil then you're giving yourself multiple options at fish moving it across. And this is the perfect style of bait to do it to because this bait is always in motion. So what, while it's walking like this, it's popping the jig with it. So you're getting, you're basically fishing your jig exactly how you would if you were just tied onto your jig and you've got the top water action. So this is a very deadly combo, especially for white bass and hybrids in our tail waters creeks and rivers good one during the spring run especially the later spring run um we haven't had the water our water temps have been there this year but outside of the southeastern part of the state we really haven't had good water flow um so a lot of the fish that are being caught i fished this past weekend on the cimarron every single fish that i caught and cleaned was all still gravid so they were still had eggs still had milk hadn't spawned yet so most of us north of I-40 and especially west of I-35, our white bass still have not spawned. As these water temps get warmer, bait fish are pushing up higher into the uh, water column. The dropper on a walk the dog style bait is a deadly combo at this time of year it, as we get into late April, early May for those white bass that are more likely to feed up on the top in your river systems now that the water temps have got into the low to mid 60s depending on where you're at this douse of rain that we're supposed to get pretty high confidence in one to three inches statewide between now and friday that's going to move all of our white bass so if you haven't got in on the white bass yet and you live anywhere except for maybe like the hugo the kayamichi drainage the uh, mountain fork drainage that got a ton of water during that window when temperatures were around 55 degrees You'll still have some late spawners down there, but the peak of their run has probably passed. 80% of the rest of the state, we haven't had our run yet. So look towards the end of this week, especially this weekend. If you've got good access to tailwaters, um, any of our prairie streams, the Canadians, the Cimarron, uh, Deep Fork, anywhere, especially closer to the lakes, because we haven't had enough water yet to push fish up river. Um, you focus on the first 30 river miles of any tributary going into any of our lakes. The majority of the state expect to have some really, really superb white bass action this weekend with the rain that we're going to get. That should be game on for them. And that'll probably be a very condensed window. Got all these fish. Water temperatures are already kind of above uh, what they consider their optimal spawning level. So they're ready to go. The second they get this rain, they're pushing to their first ideal spawning habitat dropping and going back. Their broadcast spawners don't provide any parental care, so they're in and out. So there's going to be a 72-hour window when this rain subsides that most people around the state are going to get their really, really phenomenal white bass action um, this weekend. So your poppers, your walk-the-dog type lures, especially with a dropper on them, um, 
are going to be a good way to get in on some topwater action for white bass in the river systems and creeks this weekend. Otherwise, looking to use those in the tailwaters May all the way through October. Um, you'll get especially those low light periods in the morning and the evening. Um, so some other popper style baits that are a little bit slender are called pencil poppers. So instead of having kind of the bulkier to the taper, like the true popper that's kind of bulkier up front, kind of turns into a cone in the back, keeps that nice spray the water forward. Our pencil poppers still have a little bit of a taper, but not nearly as drastic. They tend to be a little bit longer, but a little bit slender all the way through. This is starting to get into that realm of being just a little bit too big for white bass, perfect for stripers and hybrids. If you're down on Texoma, any of our lakes that have good hybrid and striper populations and their surface feeding, pencil poppers are going to be the way to go for them. Uh, pretty typical colors, either a dark back or a chartreuse back with that silver and some orange, something like this. These, if you only had two pencil poppers and we're going to Texoma this weekend, getting some top water action, that's all you'd need right there to get really into the stripers. But just like the bigger poppers, we're not going to displace quite as much water with these. So these are a little bit more of a subtle. So unlike the bigger popper, it's got that nice big mouth on it that really kinks back in so you can move a lot of water. The pencil popper, not quite as caved in and certainly not as deep and not as wide for a splash. So this one is really just flicking just a little bit of water, which is great. You, Anytime that you can be surface fishing where the objective is to kind of match what they're looking for naturally as opposed to getting a reactionary bite because you're making all this noise and commotion and fish like largemouth bass that happen to be very reactionary biters are willing to go give chase to a big, loud, obnoxious buzz bait going across the top. Most fish are looking for a more subtle profile to strike because it's just a more natural presentation. So your pencil popper is going to provide that for you. You've got good offset hooks quite a ways away from each other. So you still are going to get plenty of hookups with your smaller white bass, even if they take a non-direct approach to striking it. Those trebles are going to, you're probably going to get one on the corner of the mouth and then they'll get a face plate full of it. So you still get a good hookup. But with these, you don't have to be quite as aggressive on um, your reel turn if you are using spinning equipment. So instead of popping that reel, quick reel turn doesn't need to be nearly as fast or aggressive. You're going to figure it out on those first couple of casts what the perfect cadence is to just get it chugging across the water. And the better that you get at that, the more you can work a bait. Because they're really meant to just kind of go pop, stop, pop, stop, pop, stop, pop, stop. But everybody likes to kind of, you know, put their own spin on their top water or anything that they're fishing with. So you might get kind of like the chug, chug, chug action and then a stop, chug, chug, stop. You might want to switch up the cadence. And in order to do that, you have to know what either your popping motion with your rod tip is or your reeling motion to get it going. Typically, that's only going to take you a few casts if you're not already, you know, apt at doing it already. Um, but baits like this less water movement, you're going to have more of an opportunity to kind of short move them across the water. Whereas with the big open face, you're going to have a tougher time moving at short distances because it's going to be kind of whomping itself. Then it'll get a wake. And if you try to pop it too quickly, it might dive or it might kind of throw it off balance and it'll roll um, the line up into the treble hook. So that is something to pay attention to with all top water, but especially hard baits that have underhanging trebles. If you're casting into wind, if you throw a big looping cast, if you're not just zinging them right to the water, what can happen sometimes is that main line can come back and catch any one of these treble points. So the second you go to move it, you're going to notice that it's off kilter. Anytime that happens, strip it in as fast as you can. Sometimes a couple of quick reel handle turns will actually alleviate the problem and you'll see it float and then you can continue. But if it rolls out there and it's upside down or you see that the treble hook is pinned up against it because it caught the line, that's when you just quick retrieve them in, get it out. But that will happen. I mean, if every now and then you get a wind gust, too big of a looping cast, that line is going to get wrapped around your treble. Pretty common to happen. So when it does, don't think you're doing something wrong. A lot of times it's just environmental factors. Sometimes it just lands on the water funny. You get waves and wakes. Um, 
So some other kind of bigger profile walk the dog type lures that you might find are going to be ones that do have sort of a concave on them down here at the bottom. So, and it's arched up. So what you're going to get out of this again with that downward facing eye hole is instead of just walking this back and forth, every time it walks, it's got just a little bit of a concave right here below the eye hole. That is going to throw some water for you. So this one is a pretty good all around. Um, get a lot of different combinations. You're going to get the visual. You're going to get the walking motion. Then you're going to have uh, the rattle balls inside of it. So you're going to get auditory. You're going to be getting a lot of stimulation out of a bait like this. And again, bigger profile, bigger size fish. You're going to be looking to target big largemouth bass in the morning and evening hours, around windblown points, backs of coves. And then again, if you're chasing open water temperate bass, something like this is going to, you know, going to get a lot of strikes, but it's more apt to go find you a big fish. Uh, if you're fishing in a pond, especially farm ponds that have um, golden shiners in them as their bait source, you get a big golden shiner. Again, huge bait profile, going to be in that six, seven inch range. But something like this out on your pond, your farm pond, your neighborhood pond, city pond, if you've ever caught shiners, if you've been fishing for like sunfish or crappie using real small hooks and maybe a crappie nibble or a little piece of worm, you might have caught, you know, these eight to 14 inch, you know, kind of funny looking fish that look like golden trout. They're shiners. So if you have shiners in any of your ponds, that is going to be your secondary largemouth bait source outside of those bluegill and sunfish. This can be very good for some really, really big, small city lake pond largemouth, especially in that post-spawn period, early mornings, late evenings. You're going to see those shiners, especially if you, if you have shiners in those ponds, you're going to see the little rings out in the middle. So they're just coming up and eating subsurface bugs, little microscopic organisms, and they're going to create without breaking the surface. It looks like raindrops out on the water. And if you see a bunch of those around, casting in and around that, working those along the shoreline, shallow coves, um, that can be a really, really good big bait profile for catching really big largemouth bass, especially in farm ponds, city ponds that have shiners. So again, anytime you're looking to you know fish, whether it be any style of fishing, the closer that you can relate your, your lure choice to what the natural prey bait may be, more odds you're going to get bit more often. Um, so some walk this dog style lures that are not meant to be walked, but instead of uh, straight retrieved in, which are going to be great for your spinning equipment, are going to be propeller baits like this Hedden Torpedo. So this is a very old school bait again, hasn't changed a lot over the decades. Got a little metal torpedo here on the back, little spin wheel. And all this is doing, like our jitterbug, we have a perfectly parallel facing eye hole. So it's meant to just be casted out. Hold your lure parallel with, or your rod tip parallel with the water at 10 o'clock to two o'clock. And all you're going to do is slow to medium retrieve this in. And that propeller is going to create just like the jitterbug, a very, very subtle, quiet gurgle and just create a little wake behind it. So instead of that wake being off the front of the bait, that wake is going to be off of the back of the bait. These are dynamite for like smallmouth bass um, in moving current because you don't have to walk a dog through the current. You can cast these just a little bit upstream or straight cross current to the far bank cross the main current into that slack water, bring it out into the seam. And as you reel it, it's going to get some little walk the dog action naturally because of the moving current. You're going to get that little propeller going on the back. Dynamite bait for river and creek smallmouth if you're looking to fish top water. These torpedoes and either a, um, they come in a few different sizes. I always prefer the smaller size baits. So these are going to be your medium sized torpedoes, something in this kind of clear translucent bait um, or just in your, you know, bait fish shad pattern, dark back, silver underbody, little red on it. These are going to be your medium sized. 
And then we're going to have our small size, which I think is an inch and seven eighths, which is a really good bait profile, especially for smallmouth bass. And then you're looking at using something with that chartreuse yellow body. Uh, I think these ones are labeled as like crawfish or brown crawdaddy. I don't know how it's labeled on the package, but they're just little head and torpedoes. Um, but these are going to be your two bang up winners on like river smallmouth if you're looking to topwater fish. Really hard to beat these two baits. You can use them on ponds. You can use them on reservoirs. It's going to be a very subtle deal. So they're going to perform a little bit better um, in your open water schooling. So if you get a lot of stripers, a lot of white bass, a lot of hybrids up on top, really easy bait to throw on all three styles of uh, casting or spinning equipment. Um, but they're going to perform really well, like your jitterbug, on your small bodies of water. Clear water creeks, farm ponds, city ponds, maybe small city impoundments. Lots of good vegetative weed lines. You can work them on the outside or in that open water backs of coves. But super simple to use. Cast them out, slow to medium retrieve, get that wheel spinning, and just work it right back to you. And typically, you'll get that fish. It's going to come get right up on the rear of that bait first, and you're going to get a good true from behind strike, you get a good hookup. Um, some bigger wheel type baits, so the propeller bait that you might look to use if you're out on the big water, big murky river systems, big tail waters, big reservoirs, whether you're looking to target um, largemouth, your black bass species, usually largemouth, or your open water temperate species are going to be your Berkeley choppers, uh, choppos, or your uh, whopper floppers. So these are all Berkeley Choppos, and it basically is just taking the propeller style lure to the next level. It's putting instead of just that subtle, we have a curved tail on the back that is free, that spins. So when this spins, because of that curve back in, not only are you getting the gurgling sound on the water, but you are also tossing water with it. So having these in just some basic colors. Black is always a winner when it comes to top water, especially when you're fishing low light conditions. So backs of coves, your black is really going to be the bang up for those largemouth bass, whether you're working weed lines, backs of coves, wind driven sides of points, early morning, late evening. This is going to be a good one. You're also going to get away with this on your smaller bodies of water, your ponds. If you kind of reel it a little bit slower, slow that retrieve down just so the wheel's not spinning as fast. Subtles the gurgle, doesn't toss as much water. It effectively acts like your jitterbug, kind of that hybrid in between the jitterbug and your torpedo bait. But black, always good in your farm ponds, small impoundments, low light hours. Now, if you're fishing multitude of species, coves, points, open water, then you're looking at identifying more bait fish patterns. So you got your classic shad, dark back, silver body, um, and they come in like two different sizes. So this is the size profile I like. It's a little bit smaller. It's going to range in kind of that three, maybe three and a half inch range. And then you're going to have more of like your five, six inch bait profile. That's going to be a little bit bigger. But these golden shiner colors, again, going to be great in ponds um, that have those golden shiners in them, small city lakes. But this does a great job in low light conditions when these are flashing and turning water, having a golden color out on your big reservoirs. Um, and then your shad or a bone white color. These are going to be, you know, you can work these through, but they're going to be your very reactionary bite. You know, these are going to be kind of that just step below your buzz baits that are moving a lot of water, making if you rip these across the water at a medium to fast retrieve, you're going to be throwing a ton of water from behind it. It's going to be making a big, loud kind of like, uh, Sounds a lot like if you put a baseball card in the spoke of your bike wheel, where it's going across. That's what these sound like when you can really hear them out on the water, especially when the water's calm. But if you get any type of chop or stuff like that, these can be really effective because not only is it working through the top of that chop, but anytime that that wheel is making good contact with the water, you're also getting additional spray. Uh, it looks like bait that's getting tossed around on those windy days that are up on the surface, especially on the windblown sides of your dam, your point, creek ledges, drop-offs. That's really where those baits are going to perform well. But a still calm morning, 
you know, early light or right at last light, tossing those around shorelines, around points and coves on the big water or along the dam, you're going to get a lot of different species that may come after those from your white bass and hybrids and stripers to your largemouth bass. And then depending on where you're at, you might have some spotted bass and some smallmouth action. Um, but those are, again, really good ones to use on um, your spinning equipment because you don't need to be using the rod as much to make the bait work. It's just you straight retrieving in. Um, but these are going to be some, these choppos are going to be one of the heavier uh, full bodied plastic or metal top water lure that you're going to throw. So definitely a 30 to 50 pound braid with those or a 14, 17 pound monofilament. You really don't want to throw those with like six, eight, even 10 pound tests that might get some abrasion. They are heavy enough that when you go to load that rod tip and throw it, you can get some line breakage. Those choppos and whopper ploppers are kind of on the higher end, if not the highest end of price for your topwater lures. So you're looking at anywhere between 10 and 15 bucks for one of those lures you don't want to be snapping that off and throwing them 60 feet out into the water. So definitely make sure with those heavier lures that you're using appropriate monofilament or braided line that you're not going to get the, the potential nick in an eight pound test and you go to load it up and you snap that line at that nick. Um, so that brings us into our hybrid uh, topwater baits, which are going to be our buzz baits. So our buzz baits look just like a offset bass spinner bait so here is a bass spinner bait got our willow blades nice big skirt jig head 45 degree arm you pull these through the top of the water column middle of the water column it's a reactionary bait gets a lot of reactionary strikes so just like our buzz baits that are built very similarly we are going to have a jig head a skirt but then we're going to have more of a 90 degree arm on it instead of a 45. So how this works is you can throw it out just like this. They'll come out of the box looking just like this. Jig head, skirt, hook, blade. So the blade is what's sitting up on the top of the water and your jig and skirt, and you can pair this with a nice big soft plastic trailer, like a bumper tail or paddle tail swim bait. Try to match it with the color. So like a white or a silver or a chartreuse or a multicolored of those colors swim bait or fluke back behind this, like a three to a five incher. That's going to give you some extra action behind the skirt, or you can just throw it out with the skirt because all of these skirts on these jigs, whether it be a jig, a spinner bait, a buzz bait, anything that comes with these skirts on them, the pulsing that it creates in the water as it swims is essentially mimicking bait fish. Their pectoral fins and their tail fins creates that signature in the water, that pulsing action that is very similar to what you get out of your natural fish. And then pairing it with the soft plastic trailer gives you a little bit bigger, meatier profile, as well as some extra signature that you're throwing off in the water. But they can be thrown out just like this and get bit. These are meant to be thrown out and retrieved at at least a medium retrieve, if not a medium fast to a fast retrieve, because you've got to keep the blade up on the surface. So the blade will be sitting right here and your bait is going to be sitting about an inch underwater, a half inch underwater. So the strike itself, while you may see the surface break, a lot of times you might not. If it's a windy day, choppy, you're just going to feel the strike just like a spinner bait. So these are great for casting, spin casting and spinning equipment. There's no rod action needed. You're casting them straight out. And immediately when that thing hits the water, you're cranking and you're keeping it up on top, keeping that blade moving. So that blade is going to create flash, water disruption, water displacement, as well as some noise. It's going to make that gurgling, splashing sound. Then we got your nice, big, flashy uh, jig and skirt behind it, and then maybe a trailer attached to it. These are going to perform well. Big rivers, big reservoirs, early mornings, late evenings, or any time that you might be able to locate fish that are feeding up surface out in that open water. If you were looking to use one in a pond, I would again elect to go with more of a darker body color. So I'd be looking at using a black, either with a gold, silver, or black blade. And then maybe pairing that with like, you know, just a little dark colored or blue colored or uh, green pumpkin colored swim bait or fluke, craw, double twin tail, something like that that you could pair off the back. 
But anytime you're fishing in ponds for largemouth bass and you're fishing topwater, more often than not, you get a lot more action and bite action using dark profile baits. If you start using the chartreuses and the whites and the greens and the oranges, you will still get fish that are going to strike. But you're going to see a lot more bites in an evening or a morning or a day of fishing in a pond using a dark color lure, typically because most of our ponds in Oklahoma are 12 feet deep and less, meaning that you're going to end up with typically runoff stained water. So most cases you're fishing either downright muddy to maybe a foot, six inches of visibility. And anytime you're fishing that dark or cloudy water, when you're fishing, especially up top, you know, high in the water column or on top, that dark bait just contrasts with that muddy water. So a lot of times when we're fishing subsurface and we're looking for like a finesse bite, you might be looking to use like a white or a very um, milky shaded because those fish aren't getting sunlight. They start to lose their color. All your natural prey sources are going to start to feed into more of that white ghostly looking color. So using baits that are kind of a green pumpkin that has a white underbelly or a, or a light green that fades into white. Those are going to be good natural colors to mimic that. And then obviously your dark colors, your blacks and blues, your green pumpkins, things that directly contrast that milky water are going to get you bit more often than not because the fish can visually see them and our temperate bass and our black bass species rely very heavily on sight and sound. So if they can hear it and they can't see it, they can get on it. If they can see it and hear it, even better. And if they can see it, you know, and not hear it, if it's a subtle bait, then they can kind of visually get on it. But that's really what you're looking for. So for your color schemes, when you're fishing, ponds, creeks, stick to your dark colors, stick to your green pumpkins, your blacks, your blues, things like that. Um, and when you're in that open water, stick into your bait fish patterns, your shads, your shiners. Um, and then if you're on the big water fishing the backs of coves, heavy vegetation, then again, you might look to use something maybe in the middle, a lighter uh, brown or an orange, something that's kind of in between that really light and super dark color, but really hard to go wrong with largemouth bass using a black, green pumpkin, or dark blue as your uh, bait color. And then for your temperate bass species, chartreuses, whites, silvers, oranges, um, or any combination of those colors. That's just what where you're going to get bit the most opt, uh, often. And then you know, again, keeping in mind that you want to use a line that floats, so monofilament or braid, and then pairing it with the proper equipment, which in most cases, you want to have at least a medium action rod, unless you're using those small hula poppers or something similar um, that are meant for panfish. Uh, then you might use a light action, medium light action rod, four to eight pound test. But typically you are looking to use at least 10 pound monofilament up to 17 pound or a 30 or 50 pound braided line um, to throw. And then bait casting and spin casting equipment, you're able to use the whole range of your top water baits by using both the rod tip as your controller or your reel handle as your controller. When you're using spinning equipment, you either need to be very in tuned with your line, rod, and the weight class of the lure to be able to get that rod tip action mixed in with the reeling. Otherwise, you're looking at using straight retrieve baits like buzz baits, like propellers, um, or if you're going to be using the poppers or walk the dog or hollow body frogs, then you're really looking at controlling the lure with your reel handle and not with the rod tip to avoid getting twists in your line. Um, so with that, that kind of brings us through all of our hard baits. So now we'll just kind of talk. Uh, I'm going to briefly show a few flies if you're interested in fly fishing, which you might look to use. And then we're going to talk about public access, where, where are really good places at this time of year through the early summer that you might be able to go to both bank and boat fishing. So you got any questions? Now is a good time to throw them in there. So if you are going to be doing fly fishing, um, you know, unless you're out on a boat, in the big water, like out on a casting skiff, something like that, where you may be using baits that you can really strip across the surface for like your temperate bass species, where you might be using something that looks like this foam bodies that really hold up high. So these kind of skirt across uh, the top of the water when you strip them, got nice little 
tails on the back of them, get a nice good bait profile, got the uh, rubber legs off the end, give that pulsing action. You're going to get a nice soft, just bait fish skirting across the top. That would really be the only case where you're actually out on the water physically casting, unless you're just a diehard fly angler, in which case you're targeting largemouth bass as well. And then you might look at maybe your darker color, your black backs of coves, round points. But these are going to be really your open water flies, big foamy skirting flies. If you're on ponds, creeks, things like that, you're probably going to either be looking to use foam body terrestrial imitators like hoppers, stimulators, you know, size range, you could go all the way up to size two, all the way up to down to like size 14. That's going to be kind of your wheelhouse of the sizes that you're looking for. But on creeks, ponds, just a very classic foam bodied rubber legged hopper smack that out on the water underneath branches along big grassy banks where the wind might blow and hoppers get out you can get into pretty good pan fishing action and bass certainly aren't going to turn their nose up at that but if you wanted to dead drift nice drag free drift along uh the shoreline or the the slack current banks in the seam lines on like a Barren Fort Creek, Illinois, Glover, any of our clear water uh, smallmouth bass streams, you can get away with throwing that more traditional kind of trout dry fly, get it up. But again, when you're fishing terrestrials, stimulators, rubber legged hoppers, ants, terrestrials that are not meant to land on the water, they create a lot of commotion when they're on the water. So you don't need that perfect match of a mayfly or a caddis drag free drift you can get a little bit of movement in your bug and that might even entice a bass to come up and get it. So you definitely get away with a lot more uh, bass fishing uh, when you're fly fishing on top, just because you're usually using poppers, um, things you can skirt across the top. So like a little plastic body here that floats with the rubber legs, something like that's going to be dynamite in a pond as well as in your creeks and rivers, but natural colors. So that's a good chartreuse body and then we've got some white and black and then some yellow and black but these are going to be pretty traditional colors to look for and then our nice big foam body easy to see hoppers um, you're kind of limited with fly shop options here in the state so you're probably only going to see like you know you're more likely to find a big box of like bets bass poppers so you're going to have something like that. And those are just quick strips on top of the water. That's going to be good in a creek. It's also going to be good on a pond. You're going to catch a lot of sunfish with things like this, as well as bring up your occasional largemouth. You just never know with the flies when you're going to bring up that big largemouth strike, just putting it in the right area. But creek, uh, hoppers, big foam body hoppers, um, any bass specialty kind of like top water skirt across the top flies. Um, and then your stimulators, you really don't need to get outside of that. So with that, uh, let's just talk about our public areas, um, our different types of fish species and kind of what's your best area. If you're, you might be right in your backyard or you might be willing to make a drive. Um, so the big, uh, the big draw here in the state for top water is Texoma, uh, stripers, Texoma, basically late April into the early summer months guys go and chase them out in boats you'll have just a parade of boats essentially following each other in the bait schools and watching for the boils so that's if you got a boat um when we get to the shad spawn so all of our shad look to spawn up in the riprap shallow coves windblown sides good aeration they're going to start to look to do that here middle of may so we're still probably about a month away from really getting into the heart of that shad spawn and when that happens, you are going to get temperate bass all over the state, especially on a big lake like Texoma, where you've got, you know, stripers, white bass. They're going to get up in those shallow waters. So the early mornings, late evening, you as a bank angler can really get in to stripers, both subsurface and top water. But it's more of a run and gun late evening, basically two hours before the sun goes down all the way to right at dark of just running your boat, getting out around the islands is a good place to start. Um, Got to make sure if you're on Texoma, you know the boundaries. So 
It's always good to get a Lake Texoma $12 permit so you can fish the entire lake, no problems. But if you just have an Oklahoma fishing license, then, you know, you got to know your boundaries, stay on the Oklahoma side of the water. But that's a great one starting in about the middle of May for bank anglers as well, especially on that northeastern side of the lake. There's some core property in those areas that you can old campgrounds. You can walk out onto points. There's good, get a lot of that south and southwestern winds blow into those coves. So basically everything east of the big bridge going into Durant on the southeast side of the big bridge going into Durant those are going to be your core access areas with those coves. And that's a good place to look for bank anglers early morning, late evening, basically second week of May through the fourth week of May um, is a really good time for that. And it's always, you know, it's got three great months of top water fishing for everybody else who's out there on boats. Um, your largemouth bass, I mean, ponds are great. You know, that it's always fun late April through June you catch some of the biggest bass in the state out of these small ponds, you're going to catch a lot of four five, six, all the way up to maybe eight or 10 pound bass, just depending on where you're at in the pond. But you get a lot of big strikes. You get a lot of those four plus pound fish in those smaller bodies of water. So if you're looking to top water fish, you can do it anywhere. I mean, anywhere where you can get shoreline, especially the wind driven sides of the lake, you're going to find pockets of largemouth, whether you're fishing you know, the shoreline at a Lake Arcadia or a Lake Hefner or one of our really good bass lakes, like a Cedar Lake or a Grand Lake, um, where you just, you know, they're known for their largemouth bass. But it really just comes down to wind, wind driven side, backs of coves, creek mouths up into the creeks. Those fish, especially in the eastern half of the state, a lot of your feeder bands are spring fed creeks. So as the water temperatures in those lakes stagnate, because we get later into May and June, water temperatures rise, you get a thermocline. A lot of those largemouth spotted and smallmouth bass that live in the lake are going to be looking to push into those tributaries, whether it be right at the mouth or even upstream a little bit to get that oxygen rich, cooler spring water. Those are great places to look to target um, top water all day long, but you're always going to have the best action in your low light hours and overnight hours. Um, White bass, a really good lake to get after. Um, sometimes you can do it from the shore. A lot of times it takes a boat, but Lake Latonka in the late spring, early summer is a great top water white bass lake. Um, one of the better ones in the state to really chase schools of white bass around. Um, but any body of water, you know, they can pop on any given night. So if you've got your local lake that you know as temperate bass, you go start checking out some of those local coves in the morning hours or evening hours and just kind of fish, you know, for multi-species, got crappie, bass, white bass, sunfish, walleye, sogeye, catfish. You got everything pretty much pushing shallow right now. Um, but watching the water, where do you see consistent you know, top water action, especially for those temperate bass where you really need the visual, you're not just going to get an ambush stripe from a, you know, open water striper or hybrid or white bass. You might get that in a tailwater. So all of our tailwaters are great places to throw those big top water baits. Caw, Keystone, Eufaula, um, Denison Dam, so Texoma. Those are going to be four really, really good tail races for fishing big topwater baits early morning, late evening, that you're going to find some bigger stripers. Uh, Ulaga is another good one. It's a smaller tailwater, but you'll get good topwater action. Grand Lake at Disney. They're big, big tailwaters that have temperate bass. Uh, Fort Gibson and Hudson. Those are some of our better, I mean, those are really the major tailwater fisheries in the state, but they have great populations of temperate bass. So if you're unsure, maybe you live near one of those, Start at the tailwaters. Um, tailwaters are like fishing big ponds. You get current. Uh, you've got a lot of fish in a very small area. You got a lot of bait. You got all the great factors, essentially fishing big water, big fish, but kind of in more of a pond type setting just because of the zone in which they're located. So you can spend an entire day at a tailwater, especially one of the big ones, a caw, you fall, a, um, you make a whole day out of that. You show up right at first light get those top water casts going, try to get those temperate bass coming up. Maybe you go with the walk the dog and a dropper, you get into those white bass. Maybe you see big stripers or hybrids rolling, start getting out those big walk the dog lures, big pencil poppers. Um, and then throughout the course of the day, you switch to subsurface, start throwing 
swim baits, sassy shad, spinner baits, crank baits, still keep in on the action. And then you get right back into the evening hours, fish come surface again. And throughout the course of the day, you may see some surfacing. So tailwaters are great places to go for bank anglers, especially April through June in Oklahoma, guaranteed to be fished there, almost guaranteed to be running water. They're just great places to make a whole day out of bank fishing. If you're going to your local big reservoir or medium sized lake, then you probably want to start with places close to home. Go a couple of evenings or a couple of mornings, watch what you're seeing, you know, monitor what the weather conditions were like, which way was the wind blowing? What was the air temperature? Just little things that, you know, you can try to replicate over time, but those are going to be your best bets focusing on the north sides of the lake, wind driven points into the back of those coves early morning, late evening. Um, And if you can find some hot spots and try to replicate that, great. Then you can start translating things that happen there to maybe traveling a distance to go bank fishing. Now, when you're in a boat, you got a lot more options because you got your electronics. You can run and gun and get to different locations. So your options are a little bit more open. It really just comes down to, you know, how aggressive of are you as an angler? Are you the type of person who shows up and I'm going to run and gun until I get into fish? Or am I going to go kind of pick apart a zone that I feel should hold fish? I've been told holds fish. It's got all the good ingredients and I'm really going to work that area hard. Um, That's just really kind of your options as your boat angler. But as a boat angler, you pretty much have access to fish 365. They're out there. You can find them. You just got to figure out how to catch them. So with top water, you're really looking for that surface feeding of temperate bass and then targeting the backs of coves, wind driven sides, rip wrap areas, weed lines, areas that have lots of docks around them, a big cove that's got a ton of docks, you know, flipping every single dock and working them. And you'll start to pattern out where those largemouth are at. Are those largemouth in the backs of the coves in the shallower water, or are they favoring the docks that are more towards the mouth of the cove where they have quick transition from really shallow at the front of the dock all the way out to the deeper water at the end of the dock. And then you'll figure out, Hey, if I'm skipping them up underneath this dock with a big black hollow bodied frog, bluegill type imitator, that's where I'm getting my strikes in that shaded water. You're going to start to see that as you get into more of the dog days of summer. Right now, all the way through early June, you might see those fish way up closer to the bank and lots of different types of topwater baits are going to get their attention. But those are the options that you have on a boat. Bank anglers, you really got to try to, you know, maximize the amount of time that you got because you just waste so much time walking around, tying stuff on, maybe driving from place to place. So in order to maximize those, you know, few hours that you get to go fishing, focusing on things like your neighborhood ponds, your city lake, your big tailwaters, those are going to be the areas that you're going to find success more often than not. And you're going to, you know, build that confidence to be able to take those techniques and then translate them to other areas. If you go on a camping trip, get invited somewhere, just get a wild hair and want to go drive to a new body of water, then you take those principles with you. But those are definitely the, you know, kind of the big differences between a boat angler versus a bank angler for really any type of fishing, but especially top water. Top water is just so targeting one type of bite. So you really got to try to minimize the area in which you're going to have the most amount of action. So that's going to be ponds and tailwaters. And then for the boat anglers, it's really electronics and run and gun until you find those areas where you can repeat success. Um, So with that, that's pretty much all I got. We expected this one to run a little bit short, didn't have as much tackle to go through, but if anybody's got any questions, throw them now. Um, like to thank everybody for being here. We can't do these without you. Like I always mention, we're a non-appropriated state agency, so we receive no state tax dollars. We are 100% funded through license sales and then through grants and those grants that we get from U.S. Fish and Wildlife through Pittman Robertson and uh, Sport Fish Wildlife Restoration Act. Uh, that's all excise tax from fishing and hunting equipment and marine fuel. So when you go out and participate, you buy the license, you go buy fishing equipment, an excise tax from that fishing equipment goes into a big pot, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and then each state is allowed an allotment of that based on their land mass, 
the population and then the percentage of the population that hunts and fishes. So license holders here in Oklahoma, we are incredibly fortunate. One in three to one in four people own a hunting or fishing license, which means with those state dollars for selling state licenses, we're able to tap into a maximum potential of 75% match. So if we have 25% of the amount of money we need to do a project, food plots, roads, fishing docks, fishing ramps, anything conservation, habitat, all the work that you see ODWC doing out in the field, programs like this, our educational programs, they are 100% funded by you, the user. And that is the true definition of North American model of conservation. So uh, we'd like to continue that. We appreciate y'all being here. We want to help you. We want to maximize your efforts. So anytime that you have any hunting or fishing questions, please reach out to us. Reach out to your local game warden. Um, for things like white bass runs, they're going to have the most up-to-date information on CFS, current, are people fishing or people catching fish? So please utilize this as the resource. We want to help you with hunting and fishing um, and help you maximize your effort and understand that it is a choice that you get to make. Uh, you got lots of different things going on in your life. Not everybody uh, gets to spend as much time on the water and as the woods as they'd like. So when you are out there, we want to make sure that we're putting you in the best position to have success, build confidence, and uh, hopefully one day be part of passing down this great heritage to the next generations and your friends, coworkers, you know, whoever may have an interest in the outdoors. We want you guys to have the confidence to, to sit there and go through tackle just like we're doing here. So that's the goal of these educational programs. So anything that we can do or provide information you want to hear about, reach out to us, let us know, and we'll do that. So with that, look forward to this weekend. This rain is going to be great. Fishing across the board is really good right now. Great reports across the state for just about every species. And you can definitely expect with this rain that we're getting this week to really set into motion that excellent bank fishing that we get for that very small window each year. You're really going to see it. And especially if you're anywhere near white bass country, you got a creek, you got a river, especially if you're closer to the lake up here in the northern half of the state or the western half of the state. If you can access either privately or publicly those inflowing tributaries this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, that's going to be the window. You go hit that and you're going to find yourself some really good white bass action. Anybody else hitting up your ponds and lakes, you're probably going to have some really good near shore action for walleye, sawgye, black bass, sunfish, crappie, channel cats, blue cats. You're going to see a lot. This is going to be a really good fishing weekend. So tight lines, best of luck out there. Stay safe. And until next time, take care.